Welcome everybody and thank you, Lena and Carrie. Uh, we have Borgna in the room also and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining this session sponsored by GBH Education around supporting young children in computational thinking and making it fun and having and playing around with it. I'm Carolyn Jacobs. We have Denise Olson in the chat. We have a packed agenda this evening. We'll try to respond to your questions in the chat as they come in. And we have reserved some time at the end to respond to questions. Many of you submitted questions in the registration form and the presenters have seen those and have tried to work some responses into their presentation. GBH Boston uh, is Boston's PBS station and the producer of many iconic series that you see on your local PBS station. Series such as American Experience, Frontline, Nova, Masterpiece, Antiques Roadshow, lots of programs for kids like Arthur, Molly Denali, Pinkalicious, and now Work It Out Wombats all start originate at GBH Boston. And in the education department, we research and make available at no cost content and services for the equitable learning of all. PBS Learning Media, if you are not already familiar with it, we invite you to explore the site. This is where you will find the Work It Out Wombats resources you're going to see this evening, plus thousands of others. These are supplemental resources for the classroom, pre-K to 12, that cover the entire curriculum, standards aligned. You're going to find resources such as short clips that are captioned and many available in Spanish, interactives, games, lesson plans, support materials for you like student handouts, discussion questions, so please check it out, check out the site. And this is where, again, you will see the things that you're going to see this evening. The presenters this evening, my colleague at GBH, Borgna, has been at GBH for 15 years and she has been deeply involved in creating the resources you're going to see this evening. Carrie is a performance poet writer and lifelong educator of young children. And Denise and I, Denise in the chat and I have had the pleasure of visiting Carrie in her classroom and seeing a master at work. Her degrees are in education, theater and creative arts. She's very active in supporting her colleagues in her district and outside of her district. And uh, she firmly believes that um, learning should be fun. Lena started her teaching career at a school for the deaf. She's been teaching elementary for 15 years, earned her first master's in elementary ed, and recently completed her second master's in teaching mathematics and math leadership from Mount Holyoke College. In her new role as an elementary math specialist, she is eager to collaborate and empower teachers as they advocate for equity and access for all. Welcome presenters, thank you. All right, our agenda this evening is very straightforward and we're gonna get started. We're gonna start with Borgna introducing you to Work It Out Wombats and Computational Thinking. And then we're going to turn it over to Carrie and Lena, who will um, kind of tag team and talk about some of the resources that are have already been published, the lesson plans that have been published. And Carrie has had a chance to use one with her students, and she's going to share that story with you. Lena has a lot of other resources related to understanding and using computational thinking that she wants to share. And then I'll come back on at the end with some final remarks and we'll open it up for Q&A. So um, one other thing I forgot to mention is that we make available the slides, the recording, of course, and a very useful, what we call resource document. 
So the resource document, and there'll probably be a link to that in the chat. You will get links to everything tomorrow in a follow-up email. But in the resource document, we've put all the links to everything you're going to see tonight. So you don't have to copy and paste from the chat unless you want to. You're going to get everything in a resource document, and you're welcome to share that with um, whomever. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Borgna. Hello, everyone. I'm Borgna, and I'm going to introduce you to Work It Out Wombats, which premiered just two weeks ago, and it was six years in the making. It stars three wombat siblings, Malik, Zadie and Zeke, who live in a giant tree house called the Treverhood. It's full of secret passageways, gondolas, tube slides, and ropes, rope swings. And the wombats live there with their grandmother and a community of snakes, kangaroos, iguanas, and other fun neighbors. The educational focus of the show is on problem solving and on computational thinking. And it can be watched on PBS stations nationwide, and it can also be seen in Spanish. You can also stream it on PBS Kids and, and YouTube. So the show just got its very first review from Common Sense Media. And I'd love to read just a couple sentences from it because I think that it captures what the sh show is in a nutshell. So you'll see the quote on the right. This show is the perfect combination of learning, high energy characters and fun music. Work It Out Wombats takes the important subject of computational thinking and makes it understandable for young learners. Next slide, please, Carolyn. So let's have a behind the scenes look at the show. This is a four minute video that Carolyn will show you. coming to PBS Kids. I'm Ian, and I play Malik. Wee! I'm Mia, and I play Sadie. Yeah! And I'm Ring, and I play Zeke. I love that idea! Work It Out Wombats is about these three wombats and also Grandma Super. Thumbs up, buttercups! They explore and have adventures, and they love to work together to solve problems. At its heart, Work It Out Wombats is a show not just about the wombats, but about the Treberhood community and how the community comes together and they lend their time and their talents to help each other solve problems. Each floor or different house or neighborhood within the Treberhood is kind of like its own little party place. In each story, the wombats demonstrate computational thinking, learning as they go. Sometimes their aspirations exceed their proficiency. Maybe this job is too big for a pair of junior supers. That's why they need computational thinking. We've got to try something new. Let's break it down in a different way. Computational thinking helps children think in smaller chunks. First, we cleaned off the tables and counters. That way, we can sweep up anything we spill and put it in the trash. We've got a plan! Work It Out Wombats is an important show because it's not telling kids what to think, it's telling them how they can think. We define computational thinking, CT for short, as a creative way of thinking that enables children to solve problems in systematic ways. What goes on our list? Firewood, blankets, flashlight, now, who wants to get what? Firewood, blankets, flashlight. And when are we going to get it? Now! Wombats are cute little characters that they engage in computational thinking by encountering situations that require them to solve problems to come up with different strategies. I'm making the holes with my pogo stick, and I'll follow behind you and plant the seeds. In order to do that, they debug, they use sequencing. I'll step it out. Step one. They break problems into smaller components. We have six jobs to do, and now we have six people to help. They use the design process, create, test, and improve. All these really foundational skills. It worked! Computational thinking is essential for preschoolers to be able to live in today's world and also to be prepared for the world to come, the 21st century. 
I love that working at Wombat shows that families look many different ways. The Wombats live with their grandmother, Sammy lives with his dad, Kike, and Louisa lives with her two moms, Laco and Duffy. The adults uh, are always trying to pretend play to encourage imagination of the children. What is it, Nurse Zeke? Your toast says, owie! I always tell the story that I do this work for the younger version of myself, the little Kareem, um, who didn't get to see as many creative and diverse children's television productions. I wanted to make sure that children were able to see themselves in the wide variety of animals through their abilities, the way they move, the way they talk. The best cornbread? It has a secret ingredient. I like mine extra maloton, crunchy. We need something that can measure around her head. How do we do that? With apples! So get ready to mess up some fixes and fix up some messes with Work It Out Wombats! Work it out, work it out, work it out Wombats! Next slide, Carolyn. So while the show was being developed, the production team interviewed many teachers. And one of the most common questions we heard was, why teach CT in preschool or kindergarten? We know that CT prepares children for coding and programming when they get older. So what's the big hurry? Especially since there are already so many academic and curricular demands on teachers in these early grades. Next slide. So one answer to this question is that CT can help strengthen the skills you're already teaching to your students. It supports math and literacy, and it can help develop executive function and teamwork. So I'll give you a minute just to peruse some of these research findings on the slide. All right, and next slide, Carolyn, please. So what are developmentally appropriate activities for young children? I wanna read a quote I love that's from the Wombats content director, Marina Bears, who's a real pioneer in the field of CT and early childhood education. So this is the, her quote on the right side. Tools must carefully be selected for children who cannot yet read and write, who have a short attention span and working memory, who are honest in expressing engagement and frustration, who are just learning how to work with others, and who are eager to explore the world by touching, making, and breaking. And at the end of the webinar, we're gonna share a link to a very readable research paper that Marina wrote, and that's where this quote comes from. So there are four approaches to CT and coding for young children. One is early coding like Scratch Junior. And this is a visual programming language and it's for children five to, to seven. And it lets kids create their own animations and games on a screen. And it's the, the earlier version of Scratch, which is for kids eight to 16. And I wanna emphasize that Scratch Junior really is for ages five to seven. So a four-year-old would find this very challenging. There's one other really great feature about it, it's free. Two, there's robotics, and this is like Bebot, Codapillar, or Kibo. These are designed for kids as young as age three. And the Kibo rob robot, for example, can be programmed using wooden blocks and then scanning the CR codes on the blocks. And I saw a kindergarten class use Kibo, which I had never heard of when I did, and it was incredibly interesting. And these kids programmed their robots, which they also had decorated, to recreate a simple scene from Mo Willem's Elephant and Piggy story. Um, the kids were very engaged and they, they had an absolute blast. One caveat about robotics, the classroom packages can be pricey. So third, there's hands-on activities. There are a number of unplugged CT programs that don't require a computer or a robot, and you'll be introduced to one of them on Learning Media tonight. Um, these activities 
emphasize computational thinking skills rather than coding. And then there's media like wombats. So media can show children things they can't experience in person. It can model what problem solving looks like for kids. So in the case of the wombat, we see them making plans, thinking things through, and sometimes revising those plans if they're not working. And it can also feature a multicultural community with diverse characters that children can identify with. And I wanted to point out that our content advisor, Marina, has been deeply involved in all four of these approaches. She was the co-developer of Scratch Junior in collaboration with Mitch Resnick's lifelong kindergarten group at the MIT Media Lab. She's also the developer of, of the Kibo Robot Kit. And as the Wombat's content advisor, she vets the accuracy and substance of each Wombat's episode, as well as the hands-on lesson plans. Next slide, please. So here's the Wombat's collection on learning media, which is still in its infancy. As you can see, there are two video resources, and each one is paired with a lesson plan. There's more to come soon, and over the next two years, we'll be adding a total of 31 resources. And th those will include backgrounders on C and tips for teaching it. All, and all will eventually be translated into Spanish. And so now I'd like to turn it over to Carrie and Lena. And Carrie did one of these activities with her kindergarten class, and she expanded it in lots of creative ways, which you'll find interesting. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's Carrie and Lena. <laughs> Hello there. <laughs> okay, we go we to the next slide. Yeah. Thank you. So we wanted to present the seven um, CT skills. The first four here, you see the computer science terms, sequencing and algorithmic thinking, which would be following or creating a set of steps, for example. And then in the first column, you'll see the name that's used in Wombat, Step It Out. And so here you'll see what are the computer science terms and then what Wombats, the terms that they use in Wombats. And, and what I think is very important about this is that when we think about children's thinking and the strategies that they're using, it's very important that children are being provided a name for that so that they recognize and they have that metacognitive skill to be like, oh, what I'm doing right now is breaking it down. What I'm doing right now is finding and making patterns. It's very important that there is a name for that thinking. That's a very abstract concept, but being able to be precise with that is very empowering for children. And also it gives value to all those thoughts that are happening in their head. Right. So you know, here are some of, here are four of the CT skills, step it out, break it down, which is problem decomposition, finding or making patterns and connecting the cause to the effect. And if I put my math specialist hat on, when I look at these terms, I also think about the connections that it makes, to even in the future, like in the math world, problem decomposition, breaking it down is huge in math. Just think about first grade, if um, a student is being presented with eight plus seven, being able to take one of those add-ins and thinking, okay, well, to solve that, hmm, I'm gonna break or I'm gonna decompose that seven to two and five, and then eight plus two is 10, 10 plus five is 15. Hey, I'm breaking it down. So just to think about the connections that the CT skills has, it's just a great building block for um, students in the future grades. Um, if you could advance to the next slide, please. And again, here, these computer science terms, abstraction and representation, the name that's used, identify important details, the design process. We use the terms create, test, improve, and debugging, 
using fix it. And I can't help but see as a classroom teacher um, with engineering, how relevant that is. <laughs> Create, test, and improve. Um, that is definitely a term that's used a lot when you have your students do those design challenges. Okay, next yeah, slide, I'd, please. Yeah, I'd like to move to the next slide and also talk about the, the step it out and how Lena was mentioning that, you know, we have, you'll see, and that's um, also a resource that you'll have in the lesson in the unit, but um, that you have the computational skills and the way that they're described in the adult world, and then how the designers of Work It Out Wombats made it very kid friendly. And I can tell you, um, since I did one of the lessons I, and that focuses on step it out, my kids are using that term all the time. And so am I. And for instance, if they just are, um, you know, um, there's pencils on every table and they come to me and they say, I don't have a pencil. And I'm like, step it out. <laughs> what are we going to do? You know, or when you, um, you know, set out folders or their names or something like that, like things that they can, can do, you know, just step it out. Think about it. Okay. Now you need to maybe what three things do you need to do? You need to do this, this, and this. So, um, so the kid friendly names make it really appropriate. Um, it, a developmentally appropriate. Um, so here is the lesson plan. If you're not familiar with the, the format of the lessons, um, they are super teacher friendly um, and dense at the same time as being like clear and concise. So it's exactly what you want in a lesson. You can see, you know, you'll hopefully go on this later um, or you're already familiar, um, but you can see how it's broken down into the summary of the time allotment, um, learning objectives, and then the uh, prep for teachers. Um, there's other support materials that you can click on and print out. And um, these are a couple of scenes from the, <laughs> um, the, the Wombat video. And um, I just, you know, as, a, as I've been a teacher for a while, and you know that um, when you go and look at like a lesson that's planned by someone else, You've got to read it and dig in and then figure out what you're going to do as a teacher, what you might do first, how you're going to step it out <laughs> with, um, with that lesson, because um, you're going to make it your own, but you're also going to make it work for the kids that are in front of you. And I saw that there were like a lot of developmental preschool teachers here. Um, and, you know, you're going to take what you can from the lesson and, and use it in the way you want. So like what I did was <clears throat> I set up a dramatic play area where the lesson actually leads to um, setting up a dramatic play area that is the, the cafe chaos or whatever cafe you want, but a restaurant um, to practice these skills, which is excellent. But I started with that. So I started just with a dramatic play area um, as a pizza place and um, it was, you know, mayhem. <laughs> <laughs> like, because the kids were like, I want to turn, I want to be the chef. And no, you know, um, you, you know, there's no menus, there's nothing. So we let that sort of chaos happen, the true chaos happen for a little while. And then I said, hey, I know that there's this, um, there's this plan, there's this video, these wombats have opened up a cafe too, and they might be able to help us out. So when we watched it, um, I had already printed out the, the picture cards. Um, the kids were like, oh, yeah, of course. And they, you know, just related it to their own lives about when they go to um, get a pizza or when they go to a restaurant. Um, one of our students' parents owns a pizza place. So she was confirming the steps of the wombats um, that that is exactly how you do it. Uh, and so um, they then we opened up the restaurant again um, and they were able to follow the instructions and um, the, the sequence, the step it out that made sense. So there were customers, there was a chef. Um, and um, the, as Lena said that the, the CT skills, of course, they're, they're all going to overlap, but it is so important. Um, and we do this in almost every content area, right? To provide strategies, to teach the kids strategies that they can name because um, I'm finding sometimes that kids don't understand that there's like, you know, 
thinking is involved when you come up with an answer. I don't know if anyone else feels that way, but so when they understand that they're using a strategy to do something, to make something easier, and then they can really embody that, um, it, it, it's so powerful. And then you just build and it almost doesn't matter like um, what you're studying, um, but as long as you're naming the skills that you, um, that you are practicing. So although some of the skills may overlap, you are focusing on some um, of, of, of one type of skill. And the other thing that, and, and Carolyn mentioned this at the beginning, the videos are short. You know, it's not like half hour videos. So you can really fit them in um, to um, wherever you, you want to in your day. Um, they're cute, they're lovely. The wombats are adorable and the kids love them. So it was really um, a, a quite a great lesson and they um, have definitely learned some organizational systems from it. And um, they, I was telling Lena and Carolyn Borgna that, um, you know, we put, we cut the steps out um, and put it in a pocket chart. They show here, you know, there's a zillion different ways. They show here, you're writing it on a chalkboard. In the lesson, it suggests like a, a felt board, but you can do it any way you want to. What I liked about the pocket chart and um, or magnets or anything is that it's movable. And so that's part of the playfulness too, is that like they know there's a system and then they also can mess with it a little bit. So they might serve dessert first and just, you know, have a good time doing that. So, um, so it, it, the, like I said, the, the lesson plans, you can see too, that it has favorites, build a lesson. There are so many uh, organizational systems built into, I mean, every lesson I've ever seen on PBS um, Learning Media does it, but these particular ones, of course, what we're talking about, there's built-in organization systems for the teacher. So I guess we could go to the next slide. I think I covered that one. Ah, here it is, my classroom, the pizza place. So um, this you can see, um, well, you can't really see, I guess, but if you look at the picture on the right, you'll see um, you know, a letter box. That's a pizza oven, just so you know. They can cook four pizzas at once at the pizza place. <laughs> um, but what I did um, when we developed this um, dramatic play area was to build in other skills that they would need. So, and, and try to use the step it out skill over and over again. So of course there's the pocket chart with, with these um, steps. There's also bins that are numbered that have the menu, then the, the taking the order, empty glasses for water. And so this particular restaurant was a, um, they had pizza and strawberries, that's it. <laughs> that was a vote, they voted on strawberries. So we had pizza and strawberries and um, then they would bring the bill. So the, the brilliance of putting it in a dramatic play area is that you are giving them skills that they could practice in a real life application. Because real life, this is dramatic play is real life for kids, right? They're practicing being in a restaurant and they will do the funniest things. Like I have this big, this big bin, um, the suitcase, I guess that's full of Legos and it's sort of buried underneath some things. I hope you have some barriers out there as teachers. <laughs> I'm a piler, not a filer. So, but, so there was this big thing of Lego and, and one of the kids like went up with it, um, um, with a cup and just like turned the latch like he was pouring water, you know? Um, so it promotes creativity and obviously you're going to be using all of these social emotional learning skills of cooperation and working together. Um, uh, yeah, and so the cleanup too, I just wanna make sure I hit everything. The cleanup is also very valuable educationally because there are, um, they have to sort out all the supplies. So when the kids order the, the pizza, the, um, there's chefs that make it. And then when it's all done, they have to clean it up. And it's um, clearly um, 
I think it's the next slide. So maybe we could go to it and I could show you. Yeah. So it's clear where these um, items are going to go. Um, that looks a little sad right now. It kind of looked a little <laughs> a little different um, because there was matching um, labels on the on, on the counter where those items should go. So it's just like they all are playing. They all believe they're playing. And the teacher is the architect, right? Who designs this area to just put in as many skills as you can. So those skills are sorting and cleaning up. And um, another one, um, well, and I might add that when you do that, then it's more fun to play in when you come back and everything's in order. And the kids know that too. Um, so what you see here is a pizza menu um, and a pizza bill. So in um, Massachusetts, one of the um, standards is that kids have to count by fives to 100. So with just trying to incorporate um, that skill of counting by fives. So the kids order their pizza, say they want three items, of course, um, or mostly they want all the items and everything just gets dumped on a piece of cardboard and served. Um, but um, so they can, if they order two items, they'll circle that on the bill and write 10 down the bottom. And then um, the, the money, um, if you're familiar with five frames and 10 frames, it's a tool that we use to teach place value and subtraction and addition, just fantastic tools. Um, they use a penny stamp to stamp out how much they owe. So it's the same grid of like one to 25, um, five, five rows of, of five, but they're, they're stamping it one by one. So it, it reinforces what it actually, what you're actually doing when you're counting by fives. And this is all still in like the fun, um, dramatic play area where they're just still having a blast. And I mean, I know there'll be time for questions um, after. So, you know, if you have any questions about anything that I'm talking about, I'd be more than happy to uh, uh, um, answer them the best I, I can. Um, so I think um, that's all I wanted to talk about there, except um, actually, I do want to mention that we also um, incorporated the this idea of step it out into our literacy because in our literacy writing program, the kids have to write um, nonfiction writing. And so one of the categories under that is how to. And the how to um, writing, has to have, you have to break down the task into steps. Each step has to be numbered and each, uh, and each step has to have a number, a picture and writing. Just like the slide before um, with the, the cafe um, cards. So we were doing a lot of um, writing, how-to writing that um, was able to also use the step it out format. And then just, of course, like I said, the, the mathematics that we added in. So when you're setting up your dramatic play area, make sure that you um, are looking for all those opportunities to add in the step it out or the sorting or all the CT skills or, or the writing skills or literacy skills, any skill that you can get in there that appears to be playing. Um, you know, that's, that's the job, right, of the early childhood teacher is to design these areas so that kids can practice skills while having fun. And, and I think um, Carolyn Oborgna said that earlier that that is you know, what GBH is looking for too. It's like part of the mission is that it has to be engaging. It has to be fun. So um, I think we can go to the next slide now. So Carrie, just listening to how you incorporate your dramatic area, dramatic play area um, into, into that mathematical context. Um, it's just, it makes me think about how important it is that we make sure that we are giving our youngest learners the context 
in order to make sense of the work that they're doing. And I'm just putting my math hat on again and thinking about when I look at those CT skills and also that example that Carrie used, how the mathematical practices are incorporated into this context. So when we think about the standards for math practices, we think about how they are these processes and proficiencies that math educators at all levels should seek to develop in their students. And it's, again, thinking what Borgnon said about, it's not what to think, it's how we think. So if we think about what Carrie was doing there in the dramatic play area, I saw examples of model with mathematics. I saw examples of using appropriate tools strategically, um, looking for and making use of structure as well with the 10 frame, when the five frames. So all of that is being incorporated into that context, a very relevant context that makes sense for our youngest learners. Um, there's a resource if you wanted to look a little bit more closely at exploring mathematical practices with young children, pre-K through grade two. Um, I recommend this book by Mike Flynn, Beyond Answers. Right here. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> if you could um, go to the next slide, please. Oh, great. Thanks. I, I just also wanted to say something about the math practices, mm -hmm. uh, because there's also science practices too. Uh, the next generation science standards. Um, oh my gosh, I don't even know when they came out, but I think it's within 10 years. So I guess that's kind of new. Um, but when they stated the practices, um, that was what really resonated, I think, with teachers, because more and more kids are, are able to find out facts. Um, well, we hope, <laughs> I guess, um, you know, through, through their phones or on computers that you can find some of those things. But if you don't know how to think about them, it's not going to matter. And the focus for the next generation um, science standards was on the practices, you know, to make sure that kids know, as Borgna said, Lena said, it's just so important how to think. We're not telling them what to think. We're not telling them answers. We're guiding them along as they um, build these CT skills, science practice skills, mathematic practice skills. Once you have those skills, you can learn anything and apply it to any content area. You're probably wondering what this colorful slide's about. <laughs> uh, well, Borgna mentioned um, um, Mitchell Resnick from MIT as being um, a co-creator of uh, Scratch Junior. So this is the book that he wrote. I bought it thinking it was the best thing in the world because it was everybody's in kindergarten forever and I love it. Um, I am because that's where I teach. But, um, but it's actually... Um, a lot about um, Mitchell Resnick's um, learning lab at MIT mimicking the um, interactive um, play um, methods in preschool and kindergarten that allow for new ideas. So at, at MIT, that lab is, you know, they have just, you know, a 3D printers and you're just kind of playing and coming up with ideas. And it's a really excellent book. And Scratch Junior, as Borgna had said earlier, is for five through seven. Uh, every time we play it, which is not, you know, I don't spend a lot of time on devices, but when we play it, um, the, the kids are teaching each other. And that is part of the design, is that it is a collaboration. It's not, you know, supposed to be something where someone's alone doing this. So there's skills about, you know, taking pictures and adding sounds and stuff. So it's just an excellent book. Here on the other side of that is, as you can see, is uh, this is an activity list that the kids have in their folders. And so since we were talking about um, the step it out and um, breaking things down into steps, I tried to incorporate all these other centers um, to do the same type of skill. So the how-to books is straight out of our literacy program, um, Lucy Calkins, which I'm still a fan, everybody. 
I know there needs to be some changes, but I'm still a fan. Um, and the pizza math was really just sequencing and, and reviewing the counting by fives. Again, washing your hands was just instructional, like step it out, um, just sequencing. And so you can see that all of these, I love Lucy Calkins, Eileen, me and you, all right. <laughs> It's out of Columbia University, come on, it's okay. Um, and the drawing area step-by-step, step, which is always there. So the kids just like are independent with their folders and they go to each center um, and there's a lot of freedom in that time, but it's also highly structured by the teacher. That's how um, freedom is allowed in the classroom really is that it has to be highly structured. You decide of all the, you decide on all the choices that the kids can make and, and they can make them. So. Um, yeah, I guess that's that for that slide too. Um, so a resource that um, I wanted to share with you is Novel Engineering. And Novel Engineering comes from Tufts University. And it's a concept of using classroom literature, like uh, novel stories, um, expository texts, as the basis for engineering design challenges. And these challenges like help students, they could identify the problems and they design realistic solutions. And at the same time, they could engage in the engineering design process. So I think there's, we have some, if you want to check it out, there's a resource um, in the chat, a link in the chat, but just to give you some, an example of how it works, um, what the teacher would do is you would select a text and then you would read it out loud and you're prompting the, your students to find the problem. And you stop at a certain point while you're reading the text to think about ways that you could solve the problem, but you're looking at it through more of a design engineering lens. So for example, I know when I was in the classroom, in second, when I taught second grade, I would read The Snowy Day by Ezra Jack Keats. And while we're reading that book, the children, the students in my classroom would say something like, when I asked them to prompt, I prompted them like, what are the problems that we are um, we're seeing here? They may say something like, oh, well, Peter can't play with the big kids and the snowball fight was a little too rough or um, Peter wants to keep the snowball, but it melts in his pocket, and or Peter's snowball melted, so now his snowsuit is all wet. And then you could give, you could actually present to the children, okay, so how can we solve this problem? So some of the solutions that were created by students were like an insulated snowball saver, you know, and so, it's just a way to make these engineering design challenges really fun. Um, another example, I know I read Peter's chair oh, yeah. um, and some of the way. problems that were identified were like Peter feels like he's neglected. Um, he doesn't like his, his new stuff being painted because he got a, a new baby, um, a younger sister and Peter doesn't fit in his old chair and so what's a way we could solve this problem? Create a variety of chairs for Peter. Um, novel engineering can be used with many different texts. I've used them with reading fairy tales like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Mm -hmm. And I remember I had like a little teddy bear <laughs> at the end and the children had to use um, Legos in order to create a chair for, you know, the the baby bear whose chair like fell apart. So make way for ducklings as well, um, design a way to help the ducks, the ducklings cross a road. The three little pigs, that's a fun one. Um, design a house that will stay intact, um, like on a table and can use a hair dryer to, as like the wind. So that would be the, I'm sorry, the, the big bad the wolf. wolf. The wolf. <laughs> yes. He helps and he puffs, so right? That right now. <laughs> that guy? <laughs> yes, um, um, but it's Lena, a fun way to incorporate those design challenges. Absolutely. I think we took this course together. It was a, a, a PD, um, in-house in PD. And um, some, of the, some of the things, yeah, you can do with any book. But I, I think um, 
what is kind of neat about it too is that there's like a little bit of a progression right so um you might start it's really hard to work in groups um when you when you're little and you have an idea <laughs> or maybe even when you're big and you have an idea but um so you know you might start off with these challenges and the kids are working individually um and they're creating solutions with paper or building whatever and then trying it with a, a partner and then the magic you know talk about i know this is going to go into the next slide of productive struggle but the magic like three um kids working on something it, it just adds another challenge which is really good like when they're ready another approach is to just have like a maker space full of materials um yeah that's ideal right paper towel tubes and index cards work fine too if you don't have all this space um where it's very open-ended and the kids can use any materials that they want to but then when you start to talk about what engineers actually do engineers mm -hmm. have a budget so you are yes. getting five cards and you are getting three toilet paper tubes you know so it, it shows you ways to build up um because it, it's it's hard to solve these problems sometimes uh, uh, if you um you know it just can't be all free for all you know the teacher has to really plan on like okay so now we're going to do it individually for a little while now with a partner now with a budget um so mm -hmm. just like keep that in mind when you're looking and the boston museum of science the children's museum um just even the computational skills that you just saw with fix it at the end which is definitely in the cycle of the design model um everybody has their own like ways of looking at that when you say lena there's so many different words for it but it's all the same kind of exactly it's the so it's i think a race of ct was a create improve <laughs> it's a yeah. it's the same cycle so. it's the same cycle and and it's again like the metacognitive like thinking about your thinking is so important and being able to communicate that so absolutely Okay, Which next slide. brings us to the next slide, actually. Yes. Um, doing those design challenges really brings out productive struggle. And that may be a term that you've heard a lot in the educational world. I think a good way to define that would be purposefully reacting to an unclear challenge so that progress is made or learning is advanced or expending the, that effort to grapple with a problem and making sense of challenging ideas. And this is a resource if you're interested in productive struggle in the math world that I recommend. It really gives a good action plan for how to create a culture in your classroom where productive struggle is not only given a name, but it's also valued because really in order you're not really learning something if you're not experiencing that disequilibrium and we want students to feel comfortable with that feeling because it's evident when you're feeling that struggle that you're you're learning and that you're persevering you're developing perseverance skills and how to navigate that is just such an important um, skill for our students to develop. Yeah, I just like to follow up on that with, um, you know, obviously you, you support kids in in their their learning, but um, you know, stepping back a little bit to give them some of that time to struggle is is critical um, to their learning. Um, they just believe that you believe in them. Um, so, you know, I often, if I have kids who are super frustrated about just, you know, I don't know, thinking about um, anything, five plus one or two or whatever, um, you know, they may start to get a little anxious and I'm like, you know, I know that you're feeling uncomfortable, but your brain is very excited because your brain is made to solve problems. So think about the uncomfort uh the discomfort you're feeling is a really good thing because your brain is on fire and it wants to solve this problem and sometimes it helps and sometimes 
mm, I don't know, kids can burst into tears. And it's like, okay, so that that's a little beyond productive struggle, but um, really and, like, and go ahead, Lena, sorry. We just want, we want students to embrace struggle as it's just a natural part of life. And being able to, I, I've noticed that sometimes as students move up towards the upper elementary grades, they think smart means that I get something right away. And we really need to shift our thinking on that because that's what our students feel. And it's because they don't have that experience of grappling with something. They don't have that experience of navigating that disequilibrium and really naming it as like, oh, this is a sign that I'm learning. And so I think it's very important that we create a culture in our classroom where that's expected. And, and also it giving them those experiences so that they can feel it and name it. And also think about, I'm thinking about mistakes as well. A lot of students think like, if I make a mistake, that's a bad thing. You want a classroom where mistakes are expected, mistakes are respected and inspected. So, because it's part of learning. So it's really important. I feel really strongly that it's very important that students have those experiences because that's where we're building their, their learning. Mm -hmm. They need to struggle. Yep. And, and, and their confidence, <laughs> you know, and their confidence. And, and when you struggle, you know, like when you struggle to learn something or, you know, say you're trying to set up like, I don't know, a, I was just going to say VCR. Isn't that so bad? <laughs> so probably many of you don't know what that is. It's an old recording device. But when you're trying to set up some electronics and like you, you finally like you're struggling and you figure it out, it, it's the best feeling in the world when you figure something out. And, and it's great as a teacher to witness that, right? Lena, you just like, exactly. you see the wheels turning and I'm like, you know, trying like through like telepathy, you know, it's just like, you got it, <laughs> okay. You know, uh, but you, ha you have to be patient. You can't do things. And that goes far in preschool too. That means we can wait a little while while you put your shoe on, you know? Exactly. It goes, it goes through the whole thing. I wanted to just read a quote from Mitchell Resnick, and I think it would be a great um, way for us to sum it all up, um, Lena. Um, we talked about this. So um, this is from Mitchell Resnick, the author of Lifelong Kindergarten. I believe that the best way to help people understand the world is to provide them opportunities to actively explore, experiment, and express themselves. Absolutely. I wish we had like a longer time, but <laughs> to go yeah. over more. Well, ladies, wonderful. Thank you. It's been so much fun revisiting um, preschool and kindergarten, thinking about what has changed and what kids are getting now. It's wonderful. Uh, Borgna, um, I wanted to give you a chance. Um, this is extemporaneous. I don't think I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, we we know that there are two lesson plans from Work It Out Wombats that are published on PBS Learning Media now, and many more are coming over the next year. And Carrie had concentrated on Cafe Chaos. Do you want to just tell our audience um, a little bit about the other lesson plan that is up there? Uh, sure. Yeah. So the other one is about pattern recognition. Um, and uh, in the video, um, it's called uh, Zadie's Shell Shuffle. And uh, she, miss, she mixes up this beautiful shell garden that Mr. E, who was one of the characters, had arranged. And he's very finicky about it. Um, and she had to put it in the, back in the right order. And, and she, she wasn't sure how. So she and her friend Jun Jun figure it out. But then the activity that goes with it is, um, is, uh, is creating um, a flower garden, which you would make out of tissue paper. And first you do Mr. E's garden, which is blue, yellow, yellow, blue, yellow, yellow. Um, and then kids would go on to creating their own. So this would be a, this is a way where it, I just feel like the video and the activity are just so 
perfectly aligned. And also, especially in preschool, that's the first time kids are learning patterns and it takes a while. So um, having something like the, the media to, to show that helps. Great, thank you. And uh, lesson plans, more will be published and we'll try and notify you as they are. But again, you should uh, just feel free to keep going back to pbslearningmedia.org. And you can, uh, one way is just to go right into the search bar right here and put in wombats and you will go right to the collection of Work It Out Wombats. Carolyn, today we went into the search engine because I wanted, we studied like heart rate, you know, just because of Valentine's Day to bring it kind of in. Yeah. There is the cutest video of Grover and he's <laughs> listening to his own little and I think he calls it just like precious little cute heartbeat oh, and so very wonderful. slow and then a chicken comes in but that's a great thing about that search bar is like that was two minutes it was exactly perfect for for what I needed so use it use it use it thank you thank you and we encourage you when you go to the site to um, create an account you can see Carolyn is right here that would be me this is a screenshot of my account uh, because if you if you're logged in again everything is free uh, logging in takes about 30 seconds to set up your account and then you never have to do it again um, you can download videos you can save them to folders you can share them you can do all kinds of things um, if you are logged in and also we're fully integrated with google classroom if that is of use to you with young children i don't know i don't know if they're doing that with very young children or not Anyway, um, on learning media, I mentioned in the beginning that there are thousands of resources and we don't want to leave you with the idea that Work It Out Wombats is it. So these are just um, four what we call collection banners. This is what you're going to see on the collection page on learning media. And there will be many, many resources on that one page. So I hope that you're familiar with Molly of Denali. And there is a wonderful collection of that. Uh, Molly Denali is another animated PBS program. Um, Molly is in Denali, Alaska, and she gets into all kinds of adventures. And there is a strong instructional tie into informational text. There's also a lot of cultural information. And uh, Pinkalicious and Peterific um, is an arts and creativity animated program, again, with strong educational ties and resources. Everybody knows and loves Arthur. And Rosie's Rules is a new program that is not produced by GBH. It's a PBS program. And the tie-in is um, in social studies. So, um, we are winding down here and I wanted to put up on the screen our survey link. We have recorded this uh, webinar and you are welcome to complete the survey, uh, which I did it myself today and it, I think it took me about three minutes, two and a half to three minutes. And that was with pausing a little bit. So it's not that long. And we really do listen to what you say in the survey. It can be anonymous if you would like it to be or not. Um, and our research people do the findings and give us a summary. And we really find it very important. And we do act on what you tell us. So after the survey, um, at the end of it, you are welcome to download a certificate that shows that you attended or that you watched the recording. So you're welcome to take the survey, whether you watch the recording or you um, we're here tonight, either way. All right, um, again, I am Carolyn Jacobs. I can be your contact for anything related to GBH, PBS, getting in touch with Carrie and Lena. Feel free to email me with any comments you have or questions and I'll get you to the right people. 